of software and science. Uh, he has been supported by a number of NSF grants, including the 2015 NSF Career Award and the 2019 PKS Award, as well as by the Sloan Foundation. Uh, we're very proud of James as a long-term OSC uh, PI. James has published in the field of information science, computer supported cooperative work and information sciences, as well as given keynotes in industry and, fun, and, is, and is on funding agency advisory panels. Uh, he recently contributed um, to the development of Site as a system to improve incentives for high quality software work in science by mapping from software to its requested citations. Uh, without delaying any further, welcome James and over to you. Well, thank you so much, Manish. It's a great pleasure to be here and thanks to everyone else. So the big question of my research that frames what we'll talk about today is how does working on things made out of digital information change the way we collectively work? So uh, when we build things out of information, when we build digital things, there are two really key affordances and affordances are things we can do with the stuff, right? So digital information can be copied, although it has, it has high design costs, it's high, costly to put together, but then ultra low instantiation costs, cheap network distribution, write once, run anywhere. And that encourages us to think of software as an artifact, something that once we create it, we can easily share it. Everyone gets a car. The second affordance of digital information is that we can break it down into pieces and we can easily recombine it. And so that means that digital information is very flexible, right? It can be patched, it can be wrapped, wrapped, it can be extended, it can be recombined. And so that's really exciting, particularly in fast moving spaces like, like science and other research. It means we can have lots of new ways to do things but there's a sting in the tail of recombination as an affordance. And as we'll see in this proposal, dealing, oh, sorry, in this presentation, dealing with that needs us to think of software as an activity. So today I'm gonna to talk about software sustainability. And before we even get started, I wanna give a definition there and thanks to many years of work in the uh, workshops on, the, on software sustainability run by uh, Dan Katz and others. And I'll define sustainability as the condition that results when the work needed to keep software scientifically useful is in fact undertaken. Before we go any further, I was asked to do a slide about me. So, uh, you know, it was very exciting to be here. I came from Australia as, uh, to the US for a PhD as many international students do. Uh, it's a well-trodden path. I did my uh, PhD at Syracuse University with Kevin Crowston. And I arrived having worked a little bit in management consulting and with an undergraduate degree in economics, where I wrote a uh, somewhat embarrassingly titled Making the Cyber World Safe for Capitalism, uh, honors thesis, um, and did some master's study in software engineering, just a little bit of programming. Uh, after that, I spent some time in, in Thailand doing old school distance learning, uh, paper and pen smuggled in on the back of trucks to refugee camps uh, in Burma. Um, and I came out to my PhD thinking, you know, open source is all altruistic and open and nonprofit organizations in the developing world need help. So why don't we put these two together? Uh, and of course, as most people do, I took that topic, chopped it in half, chopped it in half again, kept going until I had a dissertation. And in, in fact, I'll get to talk a little bit about that today. Then I had a, a wonderful formative postdoc at Carnegie Mellon with Jim Herb's lab, where we started studying uh, scientific software. Um, I'm deeply inspired by people studying uh, at the intersection of science and technology studies and scholarly communication and organization science. So uh, scholars like Paul Edwards, David Ribes, Janet Fratesi, uh, Christine Borgman, um, all crucial. One of my most formative experiences was also NSF funded at the Consortium for the Science of Socio-Technical Systems, uh, CSST. Um, and people have been involved there, Steve Sawyer, Wayne Ladders, and Tom Findholt, and many others. Uh, and so that was a summer camp kind of between my PhD and my postdoc built out those networks. And last year I was meant to, you know, to help give that back by helping organize CSST. And of course that was put on hold due to the pandemic and we hope to get back to that very quickly. Um, 
Now I'm an associate professor at the School of Information. Uh, I've been very grateful for NSF support that, that Manish mentioned, and I'm very proud to work with uh, doctoral students such as Hannah Cahoon and Kaifan Du, you can, whose faces you can see there, and hoping to pay it forward now through organizing CSST, hosting a CI fellow, which is very exciting, um, also developing siteads.org, which Manish mentioned, and providing the soft site data set, which I hope to have a few minutes to talk about at the end. So that's me. Okay, so four parts uh, to today's presentation. First, I want to give some images of open source peer production, as well as software work in science, uh, based on uh, ethnographic method fieldwork. And then I want to talk at a conceptual level, drawing on conversations with many people uh, in this community over the years about why sustainability is difficult for software, and particularly software and science, drawing on some work of mine with uh, Jim Herbslet. Then I want to talk about work coming out of my career grant, which is uh, um, routes to sustainability via peer production. And finally, I want to do a little bit of forward looking and talk about uh, incentivizing sustainable ecosystems. What happens when this recombination possibility of digital information you know, starts to dominate and how we might start to get a handle on that. Then I look forward to your questions. Okay. So way back in grad school, I, like many, many grad, graduate students, was responsible for organizing references. And the screenshot you see here is the BibDesk project. And that's what I was using to organize BibTeX references. And uh, I was working on a very small laptop, a uh, little Mac 11 inch or something. And at the time, the software had two columns, one for a conference venue and one for journal. And I thought, well, look, those are never both filled. So we could merge them into the container column. And so being inspired by open source and wanting to explore it more, I, I dived into that. And, uh, and you can see here, and this comes, uh, comes from my dissertation actually, you know, this is how it was built. So I had use of the software leading to annoyance, downloading the code, copy and pasting the nearest feature, the cycle of build, test and debug, 14 hours over two days, middle of the night stuff, cause you know, I'm in grad school, there's no child to wake me up uh, early in the morning. And then I submitted an almost working patch to the mailing list and immediately got a response from somebody who said, ah, oh, this is great. Oh, I think you can advance it with this small change there. And then I was able to pull it back and inspired by that contact, I was able to build test and debug it a little bit more and then finally check a working version into the repository. So that was me, that was me working on code built that was a small incremental change that happened quickly that was built on the code of others. It was built in a community in the sense that I didn't do it all on my own, but I did all the programming on it. So when, uh, um, as I did my observations at BibDesk, I also uh, you know, found, found these emails. And you can see this is way back in 2003. So way back you know, towards the start of open source. And so this was talking about web groups where you'd subscribe to somebody's list of publications on their web page. And here's the main developer saying, uh, I really want to use this, but the conditions have never quite been right. Either I was waiting for this or that, but I ran out of free time. Um, so what happened was there was the project saying, hey, we really want this feature. This would be great, but I don't have the time to do it. And what didn't, what didn't happen then was the project setting down and building out something like this. And this is just a, an example of Gantt chart I pulled off the internet. And uh, it, it shows you know, work breakdown um, with people doing jobs that feed into each other and eventually the outcomes you want. That's what didn't happen. What actually happened was four, four, year, four or more years later, it's actually when you actually pat, uh, checked that code in. Well, actually it was an email with a patch back in those days. It was much easier than I expected because the existing groups code was so easy to extend. Kudos, I wouldn't even have tried it if so much hadn't already been solved well. So that's an example of a group deferring work that was too complex to do in the way that was available to them, which was primarily one person working on their own over time, over a period of you know, no more than two weeks, right? One person, no dependencies, no risks on other people uh, you know, in that work. And so I took those, those insights and I said, well, is that the open source way? And I went out and I looked at other projects and what I found in studying two instant messenger clients, Fire and Game, was yeah, the vast majority of tasks were individual tasks, which were solo work. 
right? So people working on their own in a short period of time and checking it in. And you can see here, taking the digital traces of their activity and the shaded area is the inter-release period. And you can see the triangles are the actual checking in of code. So the squares earlier are the community saying, hey, we'd like to do these things. But then the work itself happens when the software is ready to support it. And it happens quite quickly. So my claim is not that all open source works like this. Clearly, there's corporate involvement. And a lot of things that we think of as primary open source projects now have work breakdowns internally and teams that run open source project offices and things like that. But when you think about what's special and different about the way open source organized is it uses this affordance of a digital artifact such that work can be done in very small layers on top of each other. They're individual, short and layered and really complex work is deferred until it's easier. And it doesn't always get easier, but this allows a process of production which I think is really interesting. And this comes from a paper with Kevin Crowston that we published in MIS Quarterly. And here, what we can see if we start, uh, I hope you can see my mouse here, maybe not. Well, what you can see on the left is a growing user base using a changing code base. So the code going out into the community, inspiring ideas which fly across the top and producing new developers that are attracted in. And those stock of improvement ideas are referred to and people ask, are they motivating yet? If they are, then we think about, can we do it at relatively low completion risk? And if we do, it jumps into the software and heads out and attracts new users and contributors. If we can't, then it dives back and is stored until the conditions are right. So that's an image of, op of, of, scientific, of open source. Now an image of scientific software work. So here we say, well, how does a cubic kilometer of ice become a scientific paper? Uh, and this is work I, get, I did with Jim Hope's lab. So uh, we did interviews with the Ice Cube project. So you first find some ice, you build a big drill, you build some digital optical modules and sign them with your name. And then you drop them way down in holes in Antarctica. You gather up the data, it's all NSF sponsored work. You store and analyze it after squeezing it back and eventually shipping it back. You simulate the light in the ice. You have to simulate the atmosphere of these neutrinos. You model it. And then of course you analyze it. And this is where we really, eventually we get plots. And of course, then you get together with a few of your closest friends and publish a paper. So of course, software is everywhere through this workflow. Um, and, uh, um, and you can really get a feel for that if you read Paul Edwards work on the vast machine about how uh, all the things that go into making a, a climate science fact. In other work, we studied scientific software development with three cases where we looked at focal papers, where those papers we then looked at all the software that they uh, used in their workflow. And we went out and interviewed all of the developers of that software, uh, identifying uh, the incentives, and we worked down the stack. So here you can see an example of that there. Uh, and at the bottom, you can see, you know, the top is the workflow that we extracted through interviews, because uh, the papers don't have all this information in it. And at the bottom, you can see the pieces of software marked with the green stars. So what we did in that work was ask, well, what's motivating people to contribute to scientific software work? And we looked at, uh, as we were talking to people, we talked about the pace of their work, right? Um, so one of the things we found with the pace of the work was that people write papers every six, nine months mostly. And so they're touching that software on a much longer time cycle than somebody working with big tech, for example. Now, that's less true of infrastructure software, which runs along in the background churning out simulations. But when the scientific end users are working with it, they're touching that software on much longer time cycles. And that will be really important when we come back, talk about ecosystem complexity at the end. But what we found about motivations in science was we found software was motivated in a couple of different ways. So we found software framed as support. So here we've got a, a uh, um, cycle of academic reputation where resources turn into research, those research turns into publications, publications and citations produce reputation, which feeds back to resources. Simplistic, but hopefully illustrative. Okay, so software there can be framed as a service separately paid for feeding into research. 
We saw it framed as collaboration service work, which is interesting in these large physics collaborations. They've just thrown out this distinction between research and other things and said, hey, that's all research. And so uh, software work is done in there um, and people don't uh, break it out. We also found uh, incidental software where people were creating software as part of their regular research and uh, passing it, uh, you know, and possibly keeping it themselves, but maybe also sharing it with the community, um, but just as an in incidental to their other work. And we also saw software as a parallel software practice, right? And this is where people are working on research, but also working on software. Um, but you can see with this one, it's a little more complicated. So the software gets produced in the course of the research, and then they might produce a software publication, which might get you a little bit of reputation. But then in order to get the citations from that, you have to go through software releases, maintenance, improvement, software support, <clears throat> a little bit of hopefully use, which will eventually maybe produce some software citations, but other work has shown that that's relatively rare or at least disorganized. <clears throat> so the route to academic reputation via software is long and complicated and involves tons of work that other types of academic reputation doesn't involve. In other work, uh, Jim Herbsub and I looked at improvements and when they were shared. So we looked at the work um, of NCBI Blast and a bunch of improvements that we could find in the community. And we looked at improvements that branched from that code, but were eventually returned and given back to NCBI to take forward. We also found one, ones that weren't. And the distinction here was all of the improvements <clears throat> that were primarily motivated by academic reputation branched but never returned to the main line of development. All of the ones motivated by anything else, which might have been money, fun, a sense of duty to the open source community, those branched and returned, which suggests uh, that we have some, some issues in uh, reputation in scientific software as a motivator. Okay, so with that hopefully illustrative background, just some images of these different types of work, I'm gonna dive into the second question here, which is why is sustainability so challenging? Uh, and so this is based on these interviews from CSCW together with lots of work and conversations with people in this in the size community over time and thank you to everybody for those. So here you can see scientists using software within a workflow. Uh, and of course workflow systems are something that size has contributed a lot of support to and the size community has produced over the years. So here we can see uh, components that uh, move over time. Um, oh, look, a mouse. Uh, and you can see these are com workflow components pushing data to each other that eventually produce plots. And of course, each of these build up on dependencies uh, that build on other dependencies. And so we have entire stacks of software that are built up. Um, and of course, this, this is also based on other work by, uh, by Judith Segal uh, wrote some, um, uh, excellent stuff on scientific software development over time, uh, as did many others. So I'm gonna use a fancy word and call this a software assemblage. Sometimes you hear it called a stack. You might think of it as code that's in a directory on someone's computer somewhere. This might end up as a workflow in a formalized uh, workflow environment like Galaxy or on a supercomputer, but more often it runs you know, in code on someone's computer themselves after importing all these components. So what we saw with the interviews and scientists working, scientists and users working with the code was that they're working to reanimate these assemblages. So this is code sitting on someone's, someone's computer used to produce plots for a publication that, that, that is then picked up maybe by a student, maybe by a postdoc, maybe by the researcher herself, reanimated in order to do work. Now this very specifically and our informants laughed when we said, well, were you just running it for reproducibility? And I said, well, no, you've got to, you want to do new science. So we have to extend this software. Um, and so what we're seeing is after they quote, get the plots, they leave that code for months, maybe years. And so what that means is the cycles that are driving potential participation in science, scientific software work are quite long, much, I think, longer than work in industry. Now I don't have any, uh, firm empirical data on that. Um, and here's where I'll pause and say, you know, my job as an organization scientist here is to 
is to give you images that help you think about and recapitulate the great deal of experience that each of you has in this space. So my job will be done today if I give you some new ways of thinking about the work that you do and you see other people doing. So this pace of work is potentially much slower than in industry where software is used day in and day out. And even when infrastructure is running all the time, the users visit it every now and again. And when they come back, they come back to extend these workflows, to use the software assemblage for new purposes, for new science. So within that context, let's ask what is needed for sustainability? And it's fascinating because we know from work in software engineering that maintenance can be up to nine, nine tenths of the amount of work that goes in uh, to using a piece of software over time. And researchers in CSCW have really noted this. So Beats, uh, Matt Beats and Charlotte Lee studied this and essentially found that the work, of, the work in long term in a piece of cyber infrastructure looked very much like the work in its development. Um, but what sorts, what drives the need for work to keep software sustainable? So I'm going to argue that there's five real sources here. One is the difficulty of software production. It's hard to write software, right? It's hard to write cutting edge scientific software. It's a difficult challenge. It's also hard for people to pick up and use software. And so that can produce work because users come back and say, it's not working for my purposes. And it can take a lot of time and effort to explain how to use it or even to adjust to it. And often the developers haven't actually perceived the exact circumstances the users are gonna be using it in. But those things are true of all software production, right? Now, the third one is the rise of new possibilities. And so what we found in our uh, interviews was that people were using code to do new science, which means there's a changing scientific frontier. Um, I believe uh, the founder it was a, uh, the founder of the NSF had something to say about that with the uh, you know the ever changing the endless frontier, um, and so if you think about it, I would say that the scientific frontier changes more continually than, for example, the accounting frontier. Right. So if you think about accounting software, things do change, but they don't change at nearly the pace that work does in science. It's also true that work comes. Uh, so this is like new scientific ideas, new models, somebody's invented that everybody needs to use right now to be doing cutting edge science. Um, and also the work also comes from changing, changing technological capabilities, uh, including hardware and software. New hardware, new software that other people have written, new opportunities. And we can see that now with quantum, we, we're still seeing it with the work, uh, you know, in parallel and GPUs. I'll also argue and return to at the end of this talk that it comes from ecosystem complexity. And this is the dependencies that all the software is able to be built up on, which offers new capabilities, but also new challenges. So all this work coming in that needs to be done to keep this software scientifically over time, what are we going to do? So essentially, we've got two strategies. We either suppress, try and suppress these drivers of new work, which is quite difficult. Imagine as a you know, people concerned about software and science, how do we suppress the ability to pursue the scientific inf uh, frontier? We can try to increase the efficiency of work, right? So that it is e more easily done with automated test suites and things like that. And, and you can see a lot of that in software engineering inspired work. And it's very important, but ultimately work is always going to be needed. And so we have to attract the resources to do that work. And so here you can see a characteristically simple model uh, of uh, how resources are attracted. So resources turn into software, which eventually to hopefully turns into use. That use has some impact in the world and that impact then produces new resources to the people who need to do the work. Let's think about, uh, sorry, I think I, I said, whoop. yeah. So here I'm gonna talk about different modes of production for software or how do projects attract resources in different areas? So I'll talk about three ideal types. The first is a commercial project. The second is open source peer production. And the third is scientific grant making. So in a commercial project, we see uh, that the resources, money turns into software, which turns into use. And really what that means is purchasing software. And that use is happening in some value producing activity. Right, so it's being used by business either to have competitive advantage or to reduce costs. And that's the impact. 
Either way, that impact produces resources, either it's new profit or it's cost, the money left over after cost reduction, which produces dollars, which drives the software work that needs to be done. So this is a pretty obvious circle, right? So as the maintenance, the new development, exploring new opportunities, exploring new use cases, those arise as the developers know of the work through sales and interaction with people who've paid them, simultaneously producing the, re the work and the resources. Now I would argue in open source peer production, the situation is not that different. And if you think about this in industry, you know, you think about when Apple contributes to open source or to pick a better example, IBM uh, or, you know, any of these large companies or startups, what's happening is they've got software they want to influence for some value producing activity, some way that they attract resources. And that impact on their world produces developer time, which they push back. Now in grant making, we have resources given to projects which produce software, which hopefully gets used in science. That impact is observable in some form. Maybe it's citations, maybe it's letters of support and collaboration, maybe it's uh, accolades like prizes, right? We've been seeing software mentioned in Nobel prizes. That's exciting. Of course, those then feed through grant peer review uh, in order to produce resources. So quite a different system. And notice also the people using it are funded by the same uh, pot of money typically as would need to go to the software projects. Okay, so that lets us summarize, you know, why sustainability is difficult. First, it's the indirectness of resource attraction. Reputation is a great motivator, but also problematic. There are incompatible incentives for needed work, right? So citations, literature impacts are not directly linked. And so what that means is that researchers have a lot of trouble knowing exactly how their code is being used. Whereas um, people selling code in business know their customers. Um, scientists often don't often are surprised by their use. Um, and grants also produce what one of our informants called a service center idea where I've been given the money by the community and I must do the work. And we'll come back to that. But I don't wanna harp too much on reputation because there's also the availability um, of skilled labor. As I said, this software work in science is hard. It's cutting edge often. And so the pipelines for that labor, the programming language, the mental models, those are harder uh, to find than perhaps uh, you know, people doing work in some parts of industry. And it's also true that the open source projects in industry tend to be ones that for software that has already been demonstrated as needed and possible. Right? So I think it's interesting to think about the software that's really successful in industry as typically lagging innovation, um, whereas the software we really want to fund and make sustainable in science is driving innovation. The other thing is, and if we think back to uh, what I call productive deferral in the open source community of waiting until a project is easy enough to do, science will not wait. Right? If, you, if you as a project don't do it, one of your end users will found a new project and drive that scientific possibility that they perceive and drive it forward. We also have these different timescales of use. And so when people are inspired to work on something, it might be a year before their code is available, in which time the underlying code may have changed and made things difficult. Okay, so if that's what makes sustainability difficult, what are we gonna do about it? And one possibility has been to be inspired by by open source peer production. And there's a lot of connections here. In some ways, and some authors have even written about open source as academic production, right? Open source was inspired by academia. Well, now scientific software is being inspired by, by peer production. And the idea here is, is a peer production of open source as a route to sustainability in scientific software. And the model most often discussed is what I'll eventually call reorganization which is we fund some software and over time that project turns itself into an open source community by building software people want to use, bringing those people into the community and turning them into uh, contributors, harnessing uh, their insight on the scientific frontier. Um, but there are other possibilities as we'll see. I'll pause here for a second and say, 
here what we're actually talking about in organization science and in science and technology studies is a literature on a transfers to open communities. And we have much literature and plans and even funding programs on transfer to industry, right? So it's such that if you go to a technology transfer office and you say, I want to open source my code, they say, I don't know who deals with that. It's not us. Small, small caveat to that. I believe at Hop, Johns Hopkins, they have tech transfer office that will help people create open communities. So, you know, the big plan here is to develop a literature. What does it mean to go open in science? And so what we've been doing uh, in work with Hannah Cahoon and um, Saifan Du in my uh, NSF career funded project is looking at a, a number of case studies of successful transitions to peer production, and then a panel study of projects uh, trying to move to peer production, perhaps. Uh, so here, I'll just talk about one of the case studies briefly. So Enzo is software involved in simulations of galaxies. And so we've done interviews with uh, the producers of Enzo. And Enzo is one of these projects that has been, has been around for a long time in a model that we're starting to call the Long Center. Okay, uh, so Enzo starts out in uh, the early 90s. It's a uh, you know scientist wanting to learn C, starting to mess around, create some code, not sharing it, using it locally. Uh, and over time, scrounging together resources uh, moves forward. So what we've done is a bunch of interviews, observations at related workshops, examination of websites, publications, and then done qualitative analysis to create a timeline, identifying episodes that led to phase changes in the ENSO project over time, and what is eventually a successful uh, peer production community for scientific software code. So as described to us by informants, the, the quote, early days of the ENSO project were a project in the lab, a few people in a lab together writing code, no central base, no central code base uh, to which changes are coming and going, and copying and pasting features across personal branches. Although I'm not even sure the in informants use the word branch, they would say directories, right? So directories on a shared code, that's where the code was living. But all the work in occurring inside a single lab uh, through to around, around the year 2000, where a grant and some additional uh, you know, scrounged up money and I, our informant said uh, the rather fictional amount of 20 hours a week for a graduate student, uh, so implying the graduate students work much more, leading to a period called ENZO 1.0, which our informant described as a service center. Uh, and here, so here there was a grant that helped ENZO push this forward. They hired a, a software manager who set up version control. And now you can see this central branch where changes were coming to and from. These diagrams are illustrative. They're not based on trace data. Um, so a mainline branch internally, and then released that branch through uh, what we're calling a one-way membrane. So um, you know, that code was available, but there was no expectation of changes coming back. Um, but they did get insight into use with reports coming back from what they called the friendly users, which were other labs, some of which were postdocs uh, from the original lab, but others were not. Um, and uh, at this time, the knowledge of who was using the code and particularly who was developing the code was not super well spread. Um, and so what happens eventually is one of the descendants of the original lab ends up with a new academic appointment. Um, and it's at, it's at Stanford and it comes with startup funds, right? So a new source of resources beyond grants, different types of usage. And this person had learned to various new versions floating out there, forks if you like, through conversations at conferences and even reviewing papers. Right? So that knowledge of what's happening out there, it's not coming through a sales marketing, uh, sales follow-up team. It's not coming through bug reports and issue, issue trackers that pass through this one-way membrane. It's coming through scholarly communication, right? Um, and so what they do is actually create what they call the week of code. And this was to fly, use startup funds to fly in these people who had forks and to try to get them working together. And one thing that really struck me about this was they began with the code of the people not present. It would have been so tempting to start with the, with the old core code. But what they said was this code represents work. Let's start with the people who aren't here to talk and figure out if we can merge our code in around theirs so that we end up with something that looks more like this, where work is still happening in the labs. Things are coming into a project core now, so dissolving that one-way membrane. Um, but this was a period they called the Wild West. 
because you have the central branch to which people contribute. Now this starts to look like peer production, right? Um, with contributions coming in, all that sort of stuff. Uh, but the development's still happening in, in separately in the external labs, which is not uncommon, right? It's still taking this relatively long time frame, um, and they talk about you know big code dumps would come in, and we'd have to like you know work with those. Um, and one of the real challenges they brought up was autonomy concerns, right? Where people were working on code, but I didn't know whether I could rely on them. It might block my work. And I actually think that people talk about ego in science. But this came up more in, in our analysis, which was autonomy concerns, right? I want to be able to drive forward. The scientific frontier is there. I'm, I want to reach for it. I'm reaching for it. But I can't if I have to rely on somebody else. Um, and so there was a little bit of concern that that was happening here as you know, elements were added. And so eventually, even though this already starts to look like quite a mature open source project, they eventually develop a system called the curated branch with review gates where contributions, which you'll notice now, are becoming smaller. Uh, is that mouse? Nope, don't got it. All right, the, you can see those contributions are becoming smaller, branching off and coming back, branching off and coming back more often, but are also being checked through code review. Okay, so what, ch what changed here? Okay, what didn't change is the motivations. The code is still a scientific and side effect of scientific inquiry. There are still challenge, uh, but there are challenges. Coordination after long periods of working apart. The, the leadership had to change. And as we you know, moved to the open period, you know, we heard stories of the feelings of responsibility and emotional connection to the work, as well as a fear of missing out of the discovery and the realization of, of possibilities and the real difficulty of passing on that leadership with the emphasis there on responsibility and stewardship, right? That was really hard, but they managed it. And then deep concerns about giving up autonomy but they also didn't decide any club, any governance at the week of code. They intentionally just focused on getting the collaboration tech together, which is somewhat contrary to the org science work on, on good collaborations. Um, okay, they were inspired, but they were working alongside each other. And that leads us to a panel study of, S, of funded projects, uh, the SI2 program uh, funded by the NSF, NSF size. Uh, and here, we're examining other projects that were specifically asked to be sustainable uh, you know, as part of their grant. So they were asked to write sustainability plans. I don't know what all of them say, not all planned peer production or open sourcing as it was more called, but that was a frequent one, okay? So what we're gonna report on today is a study of 92 of these grants uh, that had started by 2014 uh, that ended up creating software, so that reduced it to 92 grants. I'm sorry, so these are all the grants funded by SI2 that started before 2014. So we, so we could watch the whole period of the grant and a little after. Um, and 84 were judged uh, to intend to create software, right? So SI2 contributed to workshops and other things like that, but the bulk of them intended to create software. And these 84 grants funded work on 114 code bases Right? And so we analyzed each code base separately, or at least the activity around them, which we call projects. And again, great thanks to uh, Hannah Cahoon, who did the vast bulk of this work. And more recently, Saifan Du has joined us as we move to the interview stage. So what we're doing is we've done content analysis over time, over, over these five year periods, looking at these projects. We've started interviews with some, and now we're working on more interviews, uh, but I can show you the emerging results. Okay, these are the sorts of things we were looking for here. We were asking these projects when they present to the world, what can we learn, right? And we adopted a persona of a potential contributor, right? Somebody who might want to have an idea of how to work with, these, with this code and want to contribute back. And we coded for things like, does the project present separately from the grant? Or does it present, we have a grant and we're writing code? Or is it, we are a project and we received a grant? We've asked about things like invitations to contribute, whether they highlight publications, um, whether they have repositories, what's the collaborative setup, do they have offline meetings, online meetings? And these codes emerged over time. And what I'm gonna to present today is a taxonomy of project types that were funded by the SI2 grant proposal. Okay, so the first is peer production. Second is what we call a tool group. The third is what we call an author group, and then a lab. And the fifth is a business. And so here you can see characteristics of different project types. So vertically from the top to the bottom are the different uh, 
organizational configurations, peer production, lab, tool group, so on. Moving across are the characteristics that we looked at. So you can see uh, what we're displaying here is whether the group was named. And surprisingly, only four of these types have names. Author groups don't. Talk about that in a second. A web presence. Most of them have web presences. Author groups don't. You can see author groups being gray there are some of the you know, least organized, least organization-like uh, entities that were funded. Um, you can see whether they have singular interests or not. Uh, you can see whether they accepted outside contributions, whether we could find evidence of that, and whether they displayed an invitation to contribute on their website. You can also see whether they featured publications and whether they discussed revenue. So what we ended up doing here over time was doing what we call a genre analysis of online presences, right? So you think of genres like horror movies, mystery movies. And what I'm gonna show now is, is uh, illustrative mock-ups of the sorts of web presences that we found. So this is a website, a mock-up of a peer production community. So you can see it's named after itself. It identifies as an open source community, has a website and its website kind of looks like this, right? Uh, there you don't see individual features, you don't see, you very rarely see publications and almost never on the front page. And you see a really welcoming and open invitation to contribute. Incidentally, we expected to find differences in collaborative infrastructures, but we didn't. Everyone uses Git and GitHub now um, and repositories. And hopefully you're going to recognize some of these. So a tool group looks a little different. And one of the features of tool group is this NSF logo at the bottom, right, where they they really identify as the grant is funding this software and this is a communication about it. We're named, we have a website, we have singular interest, we're just pursuing uh, you know, this project on this website. Very rarely outside contributions or invitations to contribute. It's mostly, more often publications. Um, author groups, the least organized, and here you can see what I'm displaying here is not a, a website, but actually a poster. And so we most often found the presence of what we ended up calling author groups as uh, SI2 PDFs, which were posters from the SI2 PIs meeting, right? That was, you know, the only web presence that we could find for some projects. And so these groups are really named, they're lists of authors, right? Uh, authors, postdocs, grad students, they, very, they really have a website. That group of authors, at least presenting this way, has a singular interest. They're gonna, you know, they're doing this grant. Um, they don't have outside contributors, they don't make invitations to contribute, they always list publications, right? This is very much an academic genre. Oh, these will often talk about an intent to open source, right? Like towards the end. Uh, you know, the, the fourth type here is a lab, and this is a really well-established organizational form in scientific, uh, in, in science and technology studies. You know, Steve Shapin has written of lab life, and uh, lots of people have written about life in a lab. And here we found projects uh, where, you know, this is a lab typically named after the PI. So it'll be, you know, the Howison lab or, uh, um, you know, the Parashar lab. Uh, and here we see, you know, the PI featured, but also their team, like people are there and um, they have a website. Interesting enough, labs have diverse interests. They pursue multiple things over long periods of time. Okay, they're not just about a piece of software. And you might actually see software as a sub feature on their website, right? They might actually invite contributions, but in a very specific way, they'll often say, join my group, right? Which really to a potential outside contributor means like become an academic and write a grant with me, or at least become a postdoc and write, uh, you know, write code. So it's almost as though a contribution would come by joining the organization through employment. Of course, they always feature publications uh, and not revenue, and they, but they don't discuss revenue. Um, we'll come back talk a little bit more about that. And of course, the, the fifth type here was businesses. We didn't find many of these, as we'll see, but here, of course, it's named with a website. The business talks about singular interests. It presents this piece of software as its product. There's almost, at least in these ones, there weren't invites to contribute, although that's obviously a possibility. I'm not arguing that's not. Very rarely publications, sometimes a white paper, uh, which is a genre of um, uh, people, you know, seeking academic credibility for their new business. Uh, and at least some discussion of revenue or at least plans of things you could purchase. Okay, so now we're gonna ask, well, given those like project taxonomies, and we'll come back to a second because each of those has different challenges in transitioning to peer production, let's examine how they changed over time. And so what our research team has done is look at and allocate these project types 
to, to the projects at the start of their grant and at the end of their grant. And so here you can see the sort of relative size of the different taxonomies. So you can see lab and tool group were the two largest. Kind of makes sense in some ways. An NSF funding program you know, is designed to reach out to those communities and sponsor the workforce development through them. But also some, uh, some of these grants did go to existing peer production communities. Some went to author groups, and as you see, just a few went to businesses. Now, by the end of the grant, there was a little bit of change. Although I want to highlight that it was mostly continuity, and you can see those lines moving across the uh, diagram you know, very clearly. But the changes are there, right? So we can see a, you know, a couple of peer, one peer production project turned into a business. We can see that uh, some uh, tool groups became peer production and so on and so forth. What we did next was then wait even longer and go back and say, are these projects active, right? Does it seem that they are still producing and maintaining software that is scientifically useful? And so that adds a third time period here where we can see we add a new category of became inactive. And so I believe the first thing that strikes you there is that it's different ratios in different organizational times, right? The author groups largely became inactive. The labs and tool, labs were kind of 50-50. Interestingly enough, tool groups continued, but look at the top, peer production largely continued. Here is one that becomes inactive. So, so if we examine that, sorry, as a zoom in and a close up, and of course the x uh, y-axis scale is changing here, but now we're just looking at projects became inactive. You can see uh, those different ratios. Um, uh, these are projects that you know, ended as labs, right? So some tool groups actually sort of lost their additional contributors over time and became labs. And then of course, some labs end up becoming inactive. Uh, and what we're doing as a project now is doing interviews on examples of, you know, that we think that represent these environments uh, more. But I wanna focus in on this one today for peer production. Now, of course, not all of these projects were trying to accomplish peer production, but many were. And these are the ones that end in peer production. And as we can see, most of them continue to be active. There's one that doesn't. But the other thing that is key to notice here, and this is a key finding of the study so far, and it's not that surprising when you think about it, but the best way to accomplish peer production was to start as peer production. So those ones at the top all start as peer production, receive a grant in some form, right? That grant contributes to their ongoing work and they continue to produce. On the other hand, we do see some changes, right? Not that many, but we do see some changes. So at the bottom, so if I zoom into those changes, we can see the, the projects that changed to become peer production. And honestly, from an org science perspective, this is remarkable, right? Changing your mode of production is, is it really huge, right? So you've got to change your governance structure, your collaboration structure, you've got to become open, all these things, really hard. And what we see is that there's two ways these projects became peer production. Most of them became peer production through what we're calling a handoff transition. And this is when the grant funded project hands their work off in some form to a peer production community that already existed and, and takes that code on and drives it forward. Super interesting. What we're calling reorganization, which is perhaps what most people think of when they say open sourcing, doesn't happen that often. And so here we can see you know, that, that a few thing, a few tool groups, right, which were sort of specifically funded for a piece of software, did in fact reorganize themselves in relatively short period of time. Because remember, for example, the long center idea of Enzo was decades of work and then a grant that facilitated that reorganization. Um, and we do see that in some of these as well. So what we're doing at the moment is doing interviews, diving more into these, I can give you a little bit of a taste here. So, um, so, you know, one of the handoffs, for example, we're all members of a professional organization and that professional organization had an open source project. So their grant funded work that uh, created code that eventually ended up in that open source project, but they didn't do the grant work in the open source project, but they had connections with it in advance. It took a long time. It took uh, you know, a year and a half of grant time to get a pull request accepted at the destination project. Um, we have another example where a, a handoff occurred to a company that was running uh, software. 
And what we think happened, and we're pursuing this further with interviews, was a postdoc went to work for that company, but then the company had experience in running peer production communities, took that code, wrapped it into their peer production community, and you know, now that community has dozens of participants and hundreds of contributions. Um, with the reorganization, one, it was a project sponsored by a national lab that actually had a long history and used a grant to fund the really difficult and distinct work of identifying a potential community of uh, contributors, reaching out to them and building, uh, you know, building sustainability that way. Okay, so what do we see here? We've got that org change is a project in and of itself. It's relatively rare. We saw little difference in collaboration tech use. We saw that hierarchy is something that has to change to move to peer production, and that can be difficult. But we also saw limited ability to diversify resources. And a lot of that's hard due to homophily, right? Which is a fancy word to say birds of a feather flock together. Um, and one of the things we've seen is that even in projects moving to peer production, a lot of it comes through descendants of the lab, postdocs, their students, um, you know, going forward, which is great for trust building, but because those groups are still writing grants to the same agencies, they rarely bring in new sources of money, right? Um, in some cases, transitioning to projects co-sponsored by industry seems to help there, and in part because it's bringing in new sources of resources. We also want to talk, you know, in the merging interviews, um, people talking about how hard it is to hand off code to an existing peer production community. Code is not a gift. A research paper in some ways is a gift to the world. You put it out there and it sits there and, you know, it's archived. Somebody else looks after it. Code is in fact a set of liabilities and responsibilities. So when a project accepts code, they're saying we will maintain this for the future. And that's a big request of somebody. So unsurprisingly, what we're seeing is the projects that were able to transition to these communities already had you know, connections to them. They were either directly funding peer production communities, which managed to write code and continue, um, or they were uh, projects that people already had credibility in. And interestingly enough, and this will come in my recommendations at the end, that is something we can look for in grant proposals. If we really care about sustainability in an area, right? If we want to fund things that are more than proofs of concept, where proofs of concepts are important, don't get me wrong, and agencies want to fund discovery, and that makes sense. But if sustainability is the answer, and we think peer production matters, then we can do things slightly differently. I'll come back to that at the end. Also want to flag here, um, if you're really interested in what it takes to move something from a personal resource to a community resource, also take a look at this work from uh, Jim Hope's Labs group with Eric Trainer and others uh, at CMU. Um, really detailed look at task and balance of responsibilities between those sharing a new bit of resource and those benefiting from it. Okay. So now I want to talk finally, and you know, towards the end of this talk here, about ecosystem complexity and how this makes it even harder. So what we've talked about at the moment is individual projects, taking grant money, doing software work, and seeing if they can be sustainable over time, and also seeing if they can create peer production communities, which largely means being open to outside contributions. And that's important, and it's a good start. But I want to return to another key cause of work, which is ecosystem complexity because peer production does not its own, you know, fundamentally deal with this. So in the time people are getting their plots, doing their scientific work, the world changes. And so the reanimation of code, uh, encounters change, updated packages, new packages, new possibilities, and that happens both in the workflow, the data sources, scientific frontier, and also below in each of the dependencies. And so each of those dependencies can become a source of new work for the code that is assembled around it. And so we, people probably know the phrase breaking change, right? If we make a breaking change, we're acknowledging that our users will have to do some work to deal with it. And in part, this cascading complexity, potentially cascading complexity, is one of the reasons that scholars have found that the work of maintenance looks a lot like the work of development, because you're constantly responding to new work. In fact, I think we should dump the word maintenance because it implies small amounts of work, but it's not. It's uh, 
software as a continued activity. So the image I want to present here is the idea of these of rocks and drops falling into a pool with intersecting circles creating incredibly complex patterns. And those patterns are producing work. And if they're producing work, then they need resources available to do that work. That's part of the definition of sustainability. Code is not so much an artifact as it is an activity. And so in, in emerging work from interviews that I started with Jim Herbstler and following up with my group at, at UT Austin, um, and also with Matt german Prey and Sean Goggins, uh, we're starting to look at what work holds a software ecosystem together, if anything, because it's incredibly hard. We're starting to categorize, break up this maintenance category and talk about sensing work, which is knowing what's happening, what's changing, what's producing work out there. Adjustment, which is actually doing that work. And synchronization, which is making sure that work gets to the right spot um, so, those, uh, so that the adjustment can scale out to a community. So I want to set this up a little bit more because ecosystem position depends on two aspects. Um, and this is you know, uh, just conceptual work that, that I'm working out. And so on the vertical axis there, you can see the number of users, right? So this is the reuse affordance. Code can spread out of the community, take new opportunities, and people are using it in the same way. So as you push up the y-axis, people using the code in the same way. Um, as you push across the x-axis though, uh, that's a change in diversity of use. And what I don't mean there is different demographic groups using code, although that would be important to know about. Unfortunately, that's not something that I am researching. I hope people do. But here I'm talking about recombination, right? And so this is code being used in different ways. So perhaps uh, the code is being used to do visualizations in one field and gets adopted in another field to do those visualizations. Um, and so that diversity of use changes. And different types of needed work scales differently with these ecosystem positions. So new feature development scales linear, linearly with more use and more diverse use. And linear is still hard, right? As the use becomes more diverse, it becomes more difficult to develop those new features. Use of support increases linearly, and maybe it is even sublinearly if we can get users starting to help each other. And if someone wants to know what motivates users to help each other, read Lacani and Von Hippel, 2003. It's about the early days of the Apache mailing list. Fantastic. By the way, the answer is learning. People learn by helping each other. Um, sensing work, knowing what people are doing out there, scales linearly with diversity of use. So as diversity of use goes up, it scales linearly, but it's actually flat with use, right? You know how people are using it. But adjustment and synchronization, now that scales exponentially with the diversity of use, because that's more and more different components, each of which is a source of change over time. That's really hard. So different production systems uh, generate you know, this work differently, uh, sorry, handle this work differently. So markets provide insight through sales and sensing at the same time they generate resources. Now markets handle the explosive ecosystem complexity work by enforcing rules on platforms. So I always laugh when people say, hey, we want to build a science platform just like iOS. And I think, yeah, are you going to curate the app store and enforce use power to enforce rules on your users? Because that's anathema to the scientific, uh, scientific values. I'm not saying it's wrong. And if a community decides to go that direction, more power to them. But the way markets control this explosive complexity is through an exercise of power to reduce recombination. Open source peer production handles this through being open to ideas from the outside, which do sensing and adjustment, and the emergence of distributions. And one of the things that distributions do is push work upstream. And that means taking an adjustment at the edge and finding the best place in the hierarchy for that work to benefit everybody around them. Now, grant funding has little here. There is this amazing period of insight in the proposal where people make their argument, but there's very little systematic process which gives insight. One would think publications would, but they lag, and software use in publications is not as visible as it could be. And so we end up with this situation where this really big challenge of going open is already there, 
But this really big challenge of e managing ecosystem complexity is very hard as well. And so it's hard to track use in scientific workflows. Um, and that makes it particularly difficult. Okay, two more minutes and then I'm done. I'm dying to hear our reactions and questions. So I also wanna emphasize that different organizational forms that you might recognize spread out this ecosystem management work differently. So we'll talk about a few very quickly. So a grant startup, you know, you give a grant to a new piece of software, they don't, they're like a stealth startup. They don't wanna to release to the world until it works because that will undermine their users. And so it's very hard for them to get that ongoing insight. A service center, which is a grant funded to manage code for a community, says we're funded to do the work for our users. We've taken a slice of science funding and we must serve them. But then you end up with this one-way membrane with, where insight like requires whole user workshops, not continual interactions. And then we can have an open project, which in a way is a massive achievement, right? Now, we can have a merely open project, which has all the trappings of openness, but no outside contributions, which means they're not really getting that sensing and adjustment work. But at least others can sense you and your changes, and that matters. We have a passively open project, and this one is sort of what I talked about in the transitions. This is where projects have accomplished these transitions to peer production. Huge success. Peer production is really hard. It's hard in industry, and we're actually seeing a reasonable amount of it in science. But it's not enough because at least these projects are getting adjustment work via contributions, but they're not yet doing the work necessary to get this synchronization. Uh, and you can see here, you know, key actions for each of the people in these areas. And that leads us to the sort of fifth level of maturity here, which is an ecosystem player. And these are people who'd be funded to build community. They know their ecosystem neighbors. They know how their software is combined with other software. And they actually have into project connections. They're already pushing work upstream and downstream. And in some ways, I think this is what the SI2 integrations, the mid-level grants, were really hoping to propagate. But it's also something that we could ask people to write about in funding programs. Show, show us your research competence, show us your ecosystem management competence. Um, so here are some suggestions on improving sensing. And uh, you know, one of the things we can do is improve the visibility uh, of use in software. And that particularly means, you know, a lot of time users are like, oh, this is my private science, you can't, you can't you know, investigate this. But users of infrastructure have responsibility to demonstrate their usage and feed that back to people. And we can also improve the discoverability of mentions in publications. And that's work I'm pursuing now through the SoftSight data set, which is uh, mentions hand-coded in over 5,000 publications designed for machine learning recognition. So go grab it, do it. I really look forward to what people do with that work. We can improve adjustment work. We could overcome the service center framing. Could we fund a program that only funds contributions to quote other people's projects? Could we write a grant solicitation that looks like that? Not what's your big idea, but how are you going to help somebody else's big idea? That would drive ecosystem interaction. Um, but the big takeaway here, uh, and, and there's work being done on this, you know, the big takeaway here is that recombination is a key affordance of software, but it leads to complexity. Visibility into that complexity and how it develops over time, that is the challenge of our day across industry, across academia. I would say at least markets and peer production in industry have methods and mechanisms but open source science work is struggling just to create open, sustainable open projects, but we must drive visibility into these complex hierarchies as well. Thank you. I'll put some of those systems uh, assessments. Hey, uh, thank you so much, James, for a absolutely brilliant talk. Right? I mean, it's just um, amazing. So I'm going to... Uh, first, let's give uh, James a virtual round of applause uh, and thank him again for this uh, excellent talk. Um, and then we have time for questions. So I see there's already one question in the Q&A, but there is a Q&A button uh, at the bottom. Um, and you can go there and enter your question and I will read it out and uh, 
have uh, uh, James answer it. So the first question uh, states, although researchers don't use the software they write every day, they use elect electronic lab notebooks almost every day, especially in life sciences. Did you look at ELN, elect uh, electronic lab notebooks, businesses in your research? What do ELNs fit? Where do ELNs fit in, uh, in the scientific software ecosystem? Does NSF have resources aimed at improving these tools? Maybe the first part is for you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm getting a little cross talk with some audio from someone. I wonder if people could, there we go. Um, Thank you, Dila. Uh, I think it's a really interesting question, right? So electronic lab notebooks, so things like Jupyter Notebook and uh, uh, you know many others, a really interesting source, a potential source of insight into, um, into software complexity. So we haven't specifically looked at those uh, because we were focusing on the SI2 uh, funding program, um, but people have done actually by gathering up uh, electronic lab notebooks that are you know, shared on places like uh, GitHub, and then being able to look at the components that they use. And in a way, those give us insight into this code that's often the analysis level code that's often buried on, on people's computers. Uh, so I think there's a lot of potential there. Um, and I'm happy to follow up with some links uh, of research that's actually started to look at those. One thing you could check out is something called World of Code, which is coming out of Audrus Marcus and Jim Herbslob's group. Um, uh, looking at that, <clears throat> uh, looking at that sort of work. Um, now, ELN businesses, I'm not quite sure. To the extent that they are actually able to generate revenue that also gives insight into what their users are doing, then they can handle ecosystem complexity. Um, uh, I know that uh, one promising uh, development area is the uh, skipped over this one, but I'll leave it up as we talk here. Is a funding program by the Chan Zuckerberg Institute that is specifically sponsoring the Jupiter, uh, it's called Essential Open, Open Source Scientific Components, and they've specifically funded uh, peer pro existing peer production, right? And so their grant funding for programs would be a really interesting place to, to look at that, and they funded the Jupiter Notebooks. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, there was another question out here. Uh, regarding visibility, do you think there is an opportunity for analytic and uh, analytic tools in software privacy focus alternatives to Google Analytics are gaining usage on the web? Is there something beyond traces and package managers or, some, or similar that could provide anonymous visibility into day to day software usage? Thank you. Very, very hard, right? So um, what uh, Elliot is asking about here is uh, what's often called telematics, right? So this is clickstream data from software that users are using or, an, or clickstream data and analytics on you know, cloud services. I've actually worked on this myself, trying to build what we called uh, scientific spyware uh, you know, with Jim's, Jim Herbslab's group. We didn't call it that, but our potential users called it, called it that. And there, is, there are real concerns around privacy that, are, that scientists express as privacy, right? They express as, uh, you know, concern about uh, competitive pressure. And in some communities, you can see this, right? So we interviewed people in the structural biology community and they're even knowing that somebody is working on X molecule gives away a ton because apparently it's such a sparse search space uh, that that's too much. So the idea of kind of having uh, clickstream data is difficult. What I will talk about one thing, which is Bob McClay at TAC has a project called Exalt, which actually looks at uh, the code running on NSF supercomputers, NSF funded supercomputers, and looks at the, uh, the libraries that are compiled for those jobs, right? So they have a sort of a formal intake system, which tries to make sure that people are using those libraries. And so Bob and TAC actually make those data available. I think electronic notebooks are, are a real possibility, but um, but I, I think that science is even more scared of that. And I think it's a bit of a problem, right? Because yes, privacy matters, but these are public resources we're talking about and there are responsibilities. And I always laugh because I, I have trouble getting scientific software people to actually genuinely request a citation, 
let alone demand people give insight in what they're doing to the code. Those are anathema to the openness. So we've got to, we've got to you know, build around this. Uh, you know, can we build a consensus that part of your responsibility of being on public infrastructure, of benefiting from public money, is showing your backstage working in more detail? Can we get over this uh, you know, genuine and reasonable concerns about competitiveness? What are the forms? So that's a, a really uh, you know, interesting area for development. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, more questions coming in. So let, next one is by Raleigh Martin. Can the lessons of software, scientific software sustainability be extended to the development and maintenance of software management infrastructure of, of data management infrastructure or is this a fundamentally different issue? Thanks, thanks Raleigh. So it's a fascinating question. How similar are data and software? Um, I think that one can do some extensions and there are other people doing really important research on this. So I would point you to Christine Borgman's uh, you know, group at UCLA. Um, also, uh, uh, well, start there, right? Because the interesting thing about data is I don't know, and I don't think anyone knows yet about how live data sets are. Right? Are we getting, to the extent that you're getting lots of new contributions or transformations of data sets, then they develop more like software as an activity that exists with all these dependencies. If they're not, then I can see them more like publications where the maintenance work is a little bit less. So I suspect if you look at work, like there's a publication called Science Friction talking about how, the, uh, how difficult metadata is you know, to understand and work with and metadata changes more than the underlying data. Uh, so I think that's important. I want to dive back for a second to um, an earlier question. Hong Wei Zhang asked uh, for references summarizing best practices. Yes. Um, and I'll bring those back up. So on this slide, Hong, Hong Wei, uh, you'll see some important links. And I really want to highlight the work of the UK Software Sustainability Institute and Neil Chu Hong as the director there. So check that out. So search our UK Software Sustainability Institute. They have tons of these sort of important materials, right? So there are a bunch of papers called 10 Simple Rules, uh, some developed by you know, people uh, who are at the NSF, others by you know, researchers, and they are you know, best practice guides that are really important. I also wanna highlight the work of the US Research Software Sustainability Institute, URSI, um, you know, Dan Katz and Kartik Ram, and they've funded workshops on community incubation, but also best practice guides. And you can find that, that work linked from the WSSSPE, researchcomputing.org.uk, it's not UK, but it's actually US based. So that's a group that was funded by the SI2 program in its uh, towards its large, which is the large has still not happened, but it could be really important because the workforce development that you're talking about, we need to fund workforce development in the capabilities of going open, but also the capabilities of ecosystem competence. Um, and I really think that, that you'll find uh, you know, use, useful papers there. And I finally wanna to point to the Linux Foundation has these open source guides which are industry-based, but really also do focus on ecosystem competence. So again, this, the work on this side is, is crucially important and, and very, very interesting. And I would, do wanna highlight that there is real ecosystem awareness in the new NSF planning, the, the 2019 blueprint uh, documents there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have a few more questions coming in. The next one is from Martin Halbert. He says, does your research suggest to you that funding agencies should think about fostering sustainability in cyber infrastructure projects in new ways? And if so, what approaches might be appropriate? Yeah, fantastic question, Martin, thanks. So I think that my data speaks to two things. One, the data speaks to actual, a reasonable amount of success in generating sustainability via peer production. Okay, there are like nine, I think it's about 19 peer production projects that are still active and going forward well. It also speaks to the possibility of transitions to peer production as a mode of sustainability. The key thing there though, is that transitions are separate just like commercialization is. So I would really love to see things like i and other efforts at NSF, which has a long tradition of funding uh, commercialization as a separate activity. And one of the things that's really key there is one of the things that's funded there is identification of potential markets. Now for businesses, that means sales. 
For open communities, it means contributors, which is actually weird, right? It's not use, it's definitely not users, it's contributors. So identifying an addressable market of contributors, we can fund that. So I think, I think funding pe existing peer production, saying to people, hey, and, and an example of that, look at the call for the CZI EOSS program. They really nailed that. You know, full disclosure, I and many others that think along my, line, my lines helped uh, write those grant proposals. Um, I also think it's really key to fund visibility into infrastructure complexity and evolution. So that's a separate line. So last point there, I think that we could have uh, additional merit uh, requirements uh, in calls that prompt reviewers to discuss their project competencies, right? So for people to really feature their ability to mentor new contributions to their project, to really feature their ecosystem awareness, right? And to really understand that those, as I see them, are aspects of intellectual merit, right? Knowing what you need to do to continue your scientifically, scientific usefulness of the software is not about a good algorithm. It's about work, it's about team, community and ecosystem competencies. And I do think that grant panels could judge those. Thank you. Uh, let's see, there's one more question. Um, it'd be useful to hear some of your thoughts about what the scientific high level objective goals question would look like included in a solicitation that's aimed at these kinds of sustainability related goals you mentioned and how projects might migrate tensions or mitigate tensions between doing transition and studying transition that have some parallels to the software versus article publication tension you called out earlier. Yeah, fascinating, there's a lot there. Uh, to me, the high level intellectual, uh, what was thinking, um, high level objectives, goals, questions, it's about framing community competencies and ecosystem competencies as intellectually difficult, challenging problems that we can derive generalizable or at least transferable knowledge about. Okay, so it's not, or it's not only about how do we build software, but how do we do community transitions, project transitions, community building, ecosystem knowledge? How do we do it in a way that builds that builds knowledge and transferable knowledge, right? So, you know, to me, that's a lot to ask people who are already working really hard to build software. Uh, so I think, I think the collaborations are really key here. So for example, uh, adding into a solicitation, evidence of, a, of understanding your addressable market of potential contributors and discussing the project activities that will lead to those contributors coming on board, right? And so that might be mentorship, um, but also uh, discussing what are the intellectual challenges there? What's actually intellectually difficult? And that's gonna naturally lead, hopefully I think, that you'll find there's some work in science and technology studies, so collaborations with organizational researchers. So if somebody wants to say, you know, the intellectual challenge is how do I, as the leader of this project, manage a leadership transition, right? And how do I do it in a way that helps other people know how to do it? How do I write about that? Um, so I think, I think that's key. On the other side, I think observability and analysis of ecosystem complexity is an area that size could really get into, right? So there are a number of firms, Black Duck Software is one of them, that do large scale source code analyses to identify dependencies within companies. Right? So essentially they're looking at the company's procurement process and saying, have you created dependencies on, on you know, a bit of code edited by one person? And Nadia Eggball's work in industry on road and bridges are really crucial to that. Um, and so I think that size could fund a, a project or a grant proposal that's really looking at how we get at this. So the sorts of things Elliot was asking about, how do we observe these dependencies, perhaps looking at lab notebooks, and then how do we analyze the, the dynamics within them? And it's kind of Network science plus plus, right? What does it look like to have a, a component that's a bottleneck as the work moves around? I think there's real intellectual challenges there. Hopefully that was useful. Thank you. Any other questions? I don't see any more in the Q&A box. 
I would like to remind everybody that uh, after that uh, there is a sec a post lecture office hour at 3 p.m. Eastern scheduled for today, and uh, and we can continue the conversation there. So I'm going to pause for a little while to see if any other questions come in. If not, I'm going to thank James again for a, a wonderful talk and some very, very timely and important issues that we're all struggling with. So thank you for your insights and your presentation. And I look forward uh, to joining you again during the um, post-lecture office hours. And I invite everybody to join, uh, join us there. So thank you again. And uh, with that, I'm going to close this uh, session. Fantastic. Thank, th th thank you very much, Manish and, and everybody.